The epistle appointed to be read for Low Sunday is taken from the first letter of St. John. Dearly beloved, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory which overcometh the world, our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit which testifieth that Christ is the truth. And there are three who give testimony in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that give testimony on earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three are one. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God, which is greater, because he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth in the Son of God hath the testimony of God in himself. And please stand for the Holy Gospel, which is taken from the Gospel according to St. John. At that time, when it was late the same day, the first of the week, and the doors were shut, where the disciples were gathered together for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be to you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples, therefore, were glad that the, when they saw the Lord. He said, therefore, to them again, Peace be to you. As the Father had sent me, I also <laughs> send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Ghost, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven, and whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, who was called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Jesus cometh, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be to you. Then he said to Thomas, Put in thy finger hither, and see my hands, and bring hither the hand, and put it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Mm -hmm. Jesus said to him, Because thou hast seen me, Thomas, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and have believed. Many other signs also did Jesus do in the sight of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and thus believing you may have life in his name. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. Please be seated. Greetings once again to all of you, and I've not had a chance to wish you a happy Easter, which I trust you have had. A beautiful Easter, of course. And um, I'm appreciative to those of you who have been so kind to yours truly this Easter. Uh, as rarely as I see you, you're very kind to me, and I appreciate that very much. Please be assured I do keep all of you uh, close to my own heart and my daily prayers, and am indebted to you who do, the, who do the same for me. This is the octave day of Easter, which also <laughs> is known as Low Sunday. Nobody seems to know why it's called Low Sunday. There are several theories, but nobody seems to really know. It's also known as Quasimodo Sunday because the first word of the intro is Quasimodo Infantes. And we, of course, know this especially well from Victor Hugo's um, story of the Hunchback of Notre Dame, who is named Quasimodo because he was born on Quasimodo Sunday. And you might have seen the old film with Charles Lawton playing the uh, Hunchback himself. And this is also known as the Sunday in White, and it's called that because the uh, all those who were baptized on Easter uh, after a three years of, of, of a catechumenate, uh, they would wear white robes from Easter until this Sunday, and then at this Sunday they would take it off and put it on the communion rail, so it was Sunday in White from all the white robes that were on the communion rail as well. So that was the that's where the the the, uh, the names of this particular Sunday come from. Please do take a bulletin home with you, which has all the important announcements in it. 
and I'm looking to see this the first time I've seen it myself. And I'm not seeing, let's see, there are reminders. There's Compline every Tuesday from 7.30 to 8 p.m. here at this chapel. And the chapel is open Monday through Saturday, 11 a.m. to noon, if you're able to pay a visit to the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, that would be wonderful. Um, and you will receive many graces from that, of course. Um, also, there will be blessing of religious articles that you may have brought for that uh, after this Mass. And let us now, deal, now kneel down and we will sing our Father and our Mary and the glory be for all of our dearly departed friends, relatives, and benefactors. Our Father's who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord. And the perpetual light shine upon them. May their souls and the souls of all the faithful be part. Through the mercy of God, and rest in peace. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Do not touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. These are words taken from the Gospel of the Friday in the octave of Easter, just last Friday. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So my dear friends in Christ, I don't know about you, but I find these to be strange words from Jesus Christ. Where, when, and whom had he ever said anything like this? Don't touch me. Everywhere he went, there were crowds around him, no. touching him. And he never seemed to notice except that one woman who came up behind him who had been suffering from uh, an issue of blood for 12 years and who said, if I but touch the fringe of his garment, I will be healed. And she was. And he noticed. And he turned around and he said, who touched me? And everybody said, what do you mean who touched you? Everybody's touching you. But he noticed that power went out from him to her, from her touching her. So nowhere else, never, and to no one, were these words ever said by our Lord. And as I said, until this point, he's constantly touching others and is being touched by them. So what is it about St. Mary Magdalene that he says these words? And even since his resurrection, he commands the apostles, touch him, feel me, see, for spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And of course, we hear in today's gospel to Thomas, who boldly says, I think he felt left out that he wasn't there when Jesus gave them the Holy Ghost, everybody else the Holy Ghost, and he wasn't there. Maybe I don't know. And uh, he says to he says, "I will not." I, you have to listen carefully. He doesn't just want to look. He wants to put his finger into the holes in the hand, and he wants to put his hand into the side where the spear pierced him. That, that's exactly what it says. And so, our Lord appears when Thomas is there, and he says, "Come here." You know, give me your finger, give me your hand, and you can imagine he did that. There's a famous painting, I don't know who painted it, it's an old Renaissance painting, and it shows Peter, James, and John all grabbing Thomas by the forearm and pulling him over with his finger extended, and our Lord exposing himself his side so that he can be touched. So it's, a, it's a comical painting, it truly is. I'd love to know who painted it, and to find that, I'd, I'd, I'd get a print of it. It's, it's, it's really quite an amazing painting. But our Lord's words to Mary Magdalene, they are unique. Our Lord has, throughout his short life of 33 years here on earth, he never said anything to anyone close to what he now says to Mary Magdalene, don't touch me. And we're compelled to ask, why such words from our Lord to one who obviously loves him so intensely? And in the question, is there perhaps the answer is it possible that Mary Magdalene loved our Lord too much? We may answer yes and no. 
So let's look at some others who have loved Jesus Christ. We might say almost excessively. We can count all the saints, but some of the more interesting ones, there's St. Joseph Cupertino. He was a Franciscan lay brother, and he's the patron saint of aviators. Did he fly planes? No. Planes hadn't been invented when he was alive. But he used to come into the church and would immediately lift off the ground and fly to the Blessed Sacrament on the, on the altar. That's why he's the patron saint of aviators. Or there's St. Philip Neri, who was the founder of the oratory. And he loves God so much that his heart expanded so much it actually broke <coughs> ribs inside of him. There was the Roman soldier at Sebast in Armenia who took the place of a hesitant martyr on a frozen lake. And of course, more in our own time, uh, living up to and dying in the concentration camp of Adolf Hitler, St. Maximilian Kolbe, who was a tremendously charitable saint as well. But to none of these did our Lord say, don't touch me, noli me tangere. Why did he say it to St. Mary Magdalene? Every, of the, every one of the four evangelists speaks of her. St. Mark in telling us that it was to her that our risen Lord first appeared. He adds, <laughs> The explanatory note to this, out of whom he had cast seven devils. When we see St. Mary Magdalene in many paintings and depictions, unlike other saints who are depicted as confessor or virgin or martyr, she's depicted as Picatrix, sinner. Mary Magdalene, sinner. That's her title. She's a sinner. And that was with St. Luke. And he called her that with that special sense to the word that needs no elaboration. We all know what it means. But St. Luke does not, of the, unlike the other evangelists, speak of her as being at the foot of the cross. We do not know from the Gospels the exact time or occasion of St. Mary Magdalene's exorcism of her seven devils, only that our Lord had cast out not just one, but seven. Exorcism, however, does not absolve of sin. Only the penitent's contrition and the absolution of the priest can do that. Or at least if the person has perfect contrition, that will also absolve from sin as well. And there was neither of these until that extremely tender moment recorded by St. Luke in the house of Simon the Pharisee. And St. Luke identif her, identifies her there as, quote, a woman in the town who was a sinner who, when she knew that he sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. And standing behind at his feet, she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. And the Pharisee who had invited him, seeing it, spoke within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would surely know who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him that she is a sinner. You can't just read these words and let them go by. You have to ponder them. You can, I mean, she wept so much that she washed his feet with her tears. And then, to dry them off, she uses her hair to dry them off. This is, this is beyond, it's beyond belief. And a dinner party. So we know the rest of the incident and our Lord's conclusion to it. And imagine yourself at a dinner party given by some important personage and the same thing happens to you as happened to our Lord what would you do would you meticulously call attention to every single detail of the incident as our Lord did quote and turning to the woman he said unto Simon dost thou see this woman oh yes he saw the woman I entered into thy house and thou gavest me no water for my feet you might wonder <clears throat> It's, an, it's, it's, a, it's a Semitic custom uh, to wash the feet of your guest when they come because they, had, they usually walk in sandals or even bare feet, bare foot, and so their, their, their feet were dirty. So you, as a courtesy, you would have them, you would wash their feet for them. And so here our Lord says, you didn't give me any water, Simon, for my feet, but she with her tears hath washed my feet and with her hair hath wiped them. Thou gavest me no kiss, but she, since she came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but she with ointment 
hath anointed my feet. Wherefore I say to thee, many sins are forgiven her, because she hath loved much. That's why. But to whom less is forgiven, he loveth less. And from this point in the story, St. Luke records that Mary Magdalene attached herself to the group of women who went about with our Lord ministering to his needs. And we see her next with her sister in Bethany and her brother Lazarus, who is sick. And we recall the miracle that our Lord worked in raising Lazarus from the dead after he had been decaying in the tomb for four days. That was the greatest miracle our Lord would work next to his own miracle of rising from the dead himself. And St. John is the only one who reports this incident occurring but mere weeks, perhaps only one week, uh, before our Lord's, Lord's own, own passion and death, this visit of our Lord to uh, Martha and Mary's house. And St. Luke has already shown St. Mary Magdalene, in spite of her sordid past, as a possessed picatrix, to be a deeply contemplative soul. It's interesting that the worst sinners often are. We can hardly imagine, then, the effect on that simple soul, purified by grace in abundance, the effect of the extraordinary miracle Jesus performed in raising her brother, Lazarus, four days dead and decayed, back into life. And mere days later, only six, before our Lord would be crucified and die on the cross himself. St. John again will report that Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus had been dead, whom Jesus raised to life, and they made him a supper there, and Martha served. So these two ladies, Martha and Mary, they were not poor. They were, they were women not necessarily of means, but they were comfortable. And Lazarus was raised from the dead, one with, at the table with them. And Mary, Mary, Mary Magdalene, took again a pound of ointment of pure spikenard. That's a particularly uh, expensive um, um, uh, ointment of, of, uh, to anoint with, of great price, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair again. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. <clears throat> So Mary held nothing back. She was an extravagant woman in all ways. And Judas, Judas Iscariot's cold assessment of the value of the ointment, if correct, would amount in those days to almost a year's wages. Because I believe it was said that it was worth 300 pence. Now, for us, a pence is not much. It's a penny. But at once upon a time, a long time ago, a penny would buy a full day's uh, was a full day's wage. So, and you see this in other other parables too. The, the uh, parable of the uh, of the, uh, uh, the workmen sent into the vineyard at different times of the day, and each were paid a penny. For us, that's ridiculous. But for them, that was a full day's wage. And then you could buy a, uh, you could buy everything that you needed for your family for one day. So, three hundred pence was a, almost a full year's uh, worth of full year's wages. And Saints Matthew and Mark both tell us that immediately after our Lord rebuked Judas, he went out to sell Jesus to the high priest for one-tenth the value of Mary's ointment. So about a little over a month's wages was given to Judas to betray Jesus. So let's look carefully, point by point, at this second time that Mary Magdalene has performed this remarkable action for Christ. We should ponder it. We should meditate upon it. Precious spikenard. This is fit only for a king. Sealed in a jar, which is not just a jar. It's an ampule of carved alabaster. And all of this is worth a year's wages. Did she open the jar and scoop it out? No, she broke it. She broke the jar, precious jar, and poured it out over his feet. And her pouring of its contents liberally over Jesus' feet as he reclined the table, not looking to see whether any dripped on the floor or trying to catch it, no. And finally drying, drying Jesus' feet with her hair. Until the whole house was filled with the ointment's odor. 
anything done like that today, you think that is a very strange person. You would. Right with her hair. So, my dear faithful, what other passage in the entirety of sacred scripture, Old Testament or New, reports an act of adoring love so exquisite, so tender, so delicate, so sweet, so extravagant? Many have cast doubt, even today, they've cast doubt on the mere existence of Jesus. He didn't really exist. There are people, supposedly educated people, who say, oh, he never existed. He just... You can't make a story like that up. You read any, any fiction, oh, it's well constructed, it flows nicely, but it's not, doesn't have all the nuances and the peculiarities that this story has. And indeed, this is true of all of sacred scripture. We have to read sacred scripture very carefully. We'll see a little later on how this goes all, also into Jesus' rising from the dead. What other lover in all the world's history, literature, mythology, or poetry has ever so eloquently manifested a love so pure, so intense, as so focused as Mary Magdalene's? We might say, well, she was certainly well practiced in this, and she was in a bad way. But now, purified of her sin, forgiven of her sin by our Lord, she focuses all of her attention on him. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has finally arrived, the one who is worthy of the intensity of her love for that she has shown. Has any image ever presented so perfectly the working of God's love for man and man's perfect response, Sir Mary Magdalene's perfect response to that love? We see in the ointment pouring from the broken alabaster jar, the blood and water pouring from Christ's broken heart on the cross, pouring down over his pierced feet. We see Mary Magdalene, her hair very long. You always see these images of the, the four people at the, uh, at the crucifixion. St. John, Mary, Jesus' mother, Mary of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. And Mary Magdalene is the only one who's not veiled and has hair down to her waist. Her hair is very long. And she quickly wraps that around those pierced feet and cross of our now dead Savior to catch in it every drop of his sacred heart's precious blood, infinitely more precious than any spikenard which we see on the altar at every Mass. Let her alone, Judas, Jesus would say, that she may keep it for the day of my burial. So most of us who will be saved will not have the crystal hot intensity of love necessary to be perfectly melded and blended and absorbed into the white hot love of the Godhead, which theologians call pathetically, frankly, the beatific vision. And so most of us who will be saved will spend more or less time in the crucible of purgatory until our love be sufficiently focused and intense for us to be drawn into and fused into the infinite furnace of love, which is the sacred heart of Jesus. Let us now look at Mary Magdalene, at the now opened and empty tomb of Christ. Nothing, nothing and no one filled her mind, her heart, her thoughts, her desires, but him. But he wasn't there. Nothing burned within her but this white hot love for him. But he wasn't there. And the scripture says, this is again that which moderns say is made up. It's not made up. It's, it's too unique to have been fabricated. It's a true story. Quote, but Mary stood at the sepulcher without. That's outside. She stood outside weeping. Now as she was weeping, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been laid. And they say to her, Woman, why weepest thou? And she saith to them, Because they've taken away my Lord, and I know not where they've laid him. We might wonder what the angels were doing there in the first place. Mary didn't want her. She didn't care. She noticed that someone at the head of where Jesus had laid and someone at the feet. 
She notices they're angelic, but they're not Jesus, so who cares? What would we do if we saw angels? I mean, what did Moses do? He fell down on the ground. What did Tobias do? He fell down on the ground. What did Abraham do? He went down and bowed down to the ground to worship the three angels that came to visit him. Read every, every other account of angels appearing to men in sacred scripture, and they invariably invoke fear, awe, terror. In Mary Magdalene, they invoke indifference, even impatience. Then there's the gardener. You can't make this up. When, and quoting again from St. John, when she had thus said to the angels, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing. And she knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus says to her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Our Lord is teasing her. He knows who she's seeking. He knows why she's weeping. But he teases her. Why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, thinking that it was the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you hast taken him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. You know, a little woman's going to pick up this fully, fully grown man and, and drag him away. I don't think so. There's a comic quality to this whole interchange. Jesus almost seems to be teasing Mary Magdalene. He knows why she's weeping. He knows whom she seeks. And to heck with the angels. Who cares about them? What writer of fiction could dream up something so farcical? Her single, simple heart sought one thing only. The lover <coughs> must have her beloved. And no one else. So stories of tragic love, they always end with love, noble or ignoble, spurned or unrequited. But God is no such lover. God always requites our love, or our lack of it for him. Don't touch me, he seems to say, for if you do, Mary, I will not be able to prevent your pouring into me. So strong, so pure, so simple, so intense is your love. Keep in mind he has said this to no one else throughout his life on earth. <coughs> Excuse me. So my dear friends, why are we so cold? in our love of Jesus? <laughs> Why are we so distracted by the shiny baubles and bangles of this passing world? Well, Father, we're not saints. We're not great saints like Mary Magdalene. So am I supposed to believe that neither are you sinners? As she was. Well, sure we are. But not as great sinners as she was and possessed of seven devils to boot. Really? So, you're somewhere in the mediocre middle. You're neither hot nor cold, neither black nor white, you're gray. You're boring, you're lukewarm. And what did our Lord say he would do to the lukewarm? I will vomit thee out of thy my mouth. But there's nothing about sin, great or otherwise, to make one apt for or likely to have the transparent sanctity that Mary Magdalene has. This was a hungry woman. And she fed on rubbish until she met Jesus. And then realized this was the proper object of the love that she had. I've emphasized the simplicity of Mary Magdalene's heart. Our hearts are often double or worse. And hasn't our Lord said, no man can serve two masters, for he will love the one and hate the other. That's how we are. We can only love one. You cannot serve mammon and God, he said. So St. Mary Magdalene's aptitude for sanctity was, if anything, worse than her aptitude. Her aptitude for sanctity, for being a saint, was worse probably than everyone's in this church, and yet she managed to attain the degree of love at the level of the beatific vision. So apparently we can too. What stops us? Well, we must really want it. We must really want it. We must will it. Not just hope for it or wish for it or whatever. We must will it. Or else we shall either never have it or we'll have it only after a very, very long time spent in purgatory. 
Do you think really that heaven will be had as cheaply as I think most of us seem to think we can get away with paying for it? No. St. Matthew says these words, ponder them well, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and only the violent bear it away. So when finally we appear at those pearly gates and we do a little no, that won't do it. Doors will stay closed. It will only be until we kick the doors down that we'll be able to get in. St. Benedict was this way. He would have a lot of young men come to his monastery to enter. And he says in the chapter of his rule, do not grant an easy entrance to those who come. Make them wait outside. Make them sleep outside. Don't give them any comfort or encouragement. Do that for a long time until they finally, by violence, come inside. We will not get into heaven unless we take it by violence. Not by just being nice. Being nice won't do it. We must kick the doors down of heaven and walk right in. Those are the kind of people that God wants us to be. St. Matthew, of course, was right in this. <clears throat> And so must we pray? We pray to St. Mary Magdalene, purest heart, simplest heart, most ardent heart. Not only of Mary Magdalene, but also of Mary, Jesus' mother. There's another beyond incredible woman, really, the Virgin Mary. We pray to them, kindle the same fire in our hearts as burns in yours and make of them these hearts, hearts of lover saints, like you, and like your namesake, St. Mary Magdalene. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Mm -hmm.